Lightning has struck Pseudopod Towers once again, and, as every week, something horrifying slouches towards your ears, waiting to be heard. What follows is horror to the core. Proceed only if you wish to be disturbed as well as entertained. Pseudopod, episode 613, September 21st, 2018. This week's story, The Challenge from Beyond, from 1935, written by C.L. Moore, and Abraham Merritt, and Robert E. Howard, and H.P. Lovecraft, and Frank Belknap Long. Hi everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast, where this week we are essentially playing host to the Travelling Wilburys of early genre fiction in the Western world. This story was an exercise in round-robin story writing, in which each of the authors continued the narrative from the preceding author's chapter. I'm not going to say anything, I want you folks to come to this cold, because there's a lot to talk about here. And, I mean, we could spend half an hour on the biographies of this astonishing group of individuals, but... We know your time is short, so we're going to keep on target. Do please look all of these people up, especially the names you may not be familiar with. Frank Belknap Long, in particular, is a fascinating human being. Now, speaking of fascinating human beings, on to our narrators, because what kind of a podcast company would we be if we did not take the time to carefully match each and every one of these sections of story written by a luminary of their field with a luminary of our field? So... Please allow me to introduce Ben Phillips, Peter Piazza, Marty Perret, Dave Robertson, and Ellie Hirschman, all of whom, as they always do, knock it out of the park. So, get ready, because we have a story for you. Or is it five? And we promise you, it's true. The Challenge from Beyond by C. L. Moore, A. Merritt, H. P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, and Frank Belknap Long. C. L. Moore George Campbell opened sleep-fogged eyes upon darkness and lay gazing out of the tent flap upon the pale August night for some minutes before he roused enough even to wonder what had wakened him. There was in the keen, clear air of these Canadian woods a soporific as potent as any drug. Campbell lay quiet for a moment, sinking slowly back into the delicious borderlands of sleep, conscious of an exquisite weariness, an unaccustomed sense of muscles well used, and relaxed now into perfect ease. These were vacation's most delightful moments, after all, rest after toil in the clear, sweet forest night. Luxuriously, as his mind sank backward into oblivion, he assured himself once more that three long months of freedom lay before him. Freedom from cities and monotony, freedom from pedagogy and the university, and students with no rudiments of interest in the geology he earned his daily bread by dinning into their obdurate ears. Freedom from... Abruptly, the delightful somnolence crashed about him. Somewhere outside, the sound of ten shrieking across ten slashed into his peace. George Campbell sat up jerkily and reached for his flashlight. Then he laughed and put it down again, straining his eyes through the midnight gloom outside, where among the tumbling cans of his supplies, a dark, anonymous little night beast was prowling. He stretched out a long arm and groped about among the rocks at the tent door for a missile. His fingers closed on a large stone, and he drew back his hand to throw. But he never threw it. It was such a queer thing he had come upon in the dark. Square, crystal smooth, obviously artificial, with dull, rounded corners. The strangeness of its rock surfaces to his fingers was so remarkable that he reached again for his flashlight and turned its rays upon the thing he held. All sleepiness left him as he saw what it was he had picked up in his idle groping, it was clear as rock crystal, this queer smooth cube. Quartz, unquestionably, but not in its usual hexagonal crystallized form. Somehow, he could not guess the method. It had been wrought into a perfect cube, about four inches in measurement over each worn face. For it was incredibly worn. The hard, hard crystal was rounded now until its corners were almost gone and the thing was beginning to assume the outlines of a sphere. Ages and ages of wearing, 
years almost beyond counting, must have passed over this strange clear thing. But the most curious thing of all was that shape he could make out dimly in the heart of the crystal, for embedded in its center lay a little disk of a pale and nameless substance with characters incised deep upon its quartz-enclosed surface. Wedge-shaped characters, faintly reminiscent of cuneiform writing. George Campbell wrinkled his brows and bent closer over the little enigma in his hands, puzzling helplessly. How could such a thing as this have embedded in pure rock crystal? Remotely, a memory floated through his mind of ancient legends that called quartz crystals ice which had frozen too hard to melt again. Ice and wedge-shaped cuneiforms. Yes, didn't that sort of writing originate among the Sumerians who came down from the north in history's remotest beginnings to settle in the primitive Mesopotamian valley? Then hard sense regained control, and he laughed. Quartz, of course, was formed in the earliest of Earth's geological periods when there was nothing anywhere but heat and heaving rock. Ice had not come for tens of millions of years after this thing must have been formed. And yet, that writing. Man-made, surely, although its characters were unfamiliar save in their faint hinting at cuneiform shapes. Or could there, in a Paleozoic world, have been things with a written language who might have graven these cryptic wedges upon the quartz-enveloped disk he held? Or might a thing like this have fallen, meteor-like, out of space, into the unformed rock of a still molten world? Could it? Then he caught himself up sharply and felt his ears going hot at the luridness of his own imagination. The silence and the solitude and the queer thing in his hands were conspiring to play tricks with his common sense. He shrugged and laid the crystal down at the edge of his palate, switching off the light. Perhaps morning and a clear head would bring him an answer to the questions that seemed so insoluble now. But sleep did not come easily. For one thing, it seemed to him as he flashed off the light that the little cube had shone for a moment as if with sustained light before it faded into the surrounding dark. Or perhaps he was wrong. Perhaps it had been only his dazzled eyes that seemed to see the light forsake it reluctantly, glowing in the enigmatic deeps of the thing with queer persistence. He lay there unquietly for a long while turning the unanswered questions over and over in his mind. There was something about this crystal cube out of the unmeasured past, perhaps from the dawn of all history, that constituted a challenge that would not let him sleep. Abraham Merritt He lay there, it seemed to him, for hours. It had been the lingering light, the luminescence that seemed so reluctant to die, which held his mind. It was as though something in the heart of a cube had awakened, stirred drowsily, become suddenly alert, and intent upon him. Sheer fantasy, this. He stirred impatiently and flashed his light upon his watch. Close to one o'clock, three hours more before the dawn. The beam fell, and it was focused upon the warm crystal cube. He held it there closely for minutes. He snapped it out, then watched. There was no doubt about it now. As his eyes accustomed themselves to the darkness, he saw that the strange crystal was glimmering with tiny fugitive lights deep within it, like threads of sapphire lightnings. They were at its center, and they seemed to him to come from the pale disk with its disturbing markings. And the disk itself was becoming larger, the markings shifting shapes. The cube was growing. Was it illusion brought about by the tiny lightnings? He heard a sound. It was the very ghost of a sound, like the ghosts of harp strings being plucked with ghostly fingers. He bent closer. It came from the cube. There was a squeaking in the underbrush, a flurry of bodies, and an agonized wailing like a child in death throes and swiftly stilled. Some small tragedy of the wilderness, killer and prey. He stepped over to where it had been enacted, but could see nothing. He again snapped off the flash and looked toward his tent. Upon the ground was a pale blue glimmering. It was the cube. He stooped to pick it up, then, obeying some obscure warning, drew back his hand. And again he saw its glow as dying. The tiny sapphire lightnings flashed fitfully, withdrawing to the disk from which they had come. There was no sound from it. He sat watching the luminescence glow and fade, glow and fade, but steadily become dimmer. 
It came to him that two elements were necessary to produce the phenomenon, the electric ray itself and his own fixed attention. His mind must travel along the ray, fix itself upon the cube's heart, if its beat were to wax until... What? He felt a chill of spirit, as though from contact with some alien thing. It was alien, he knew it, not of this earth, not of earth's life. He conquered his shrinking, picked up the cube, and took it into the tent. It was neither warm nor cold. Except for its weight, he would not have known he held it. He put it upon the table, keeping the torch turned from it, then stepped to the flap of the tent and closed it. He went back to the table, drew up the camp chair, and turned the flash directly upon the cube, focusing it so far as he could upon its heart. He sent all his will, all his concentration along it, focusing will and sight upon the disk as he had the light. As though at command, the sapphire lightnings burned forth. They burst from the disk into the body of the crystal cube, then beat back, bathing the disk and the markings. Again these began to change, shifting, moving, advancing, and retreating into the blue gleaming. They were no longer cuneiform. They were things, objects. He heard the murmuring music, the plucked harp strings. Louder grew the sound and louder, and now all the body of the cube vibrated to their rhythm. The crystal walls were melting, growing misty as though formed of the mist of diamonds. And the disk itself was growing, the shapes shifting, dividing, and multiplying as though some door had been opened, and into it companies of phantasms were pouring. While brighter... More bright grew the pulsing light. He felt swift panic, tried to withdraw sight and will, drop the flash. The cube had no need now of the ray. And he could not withdraw. Could not withdraw? Why, he himself was being sucked into that disk, which was now a globe within which unnameable shapes danced to a music that bathed the globe with steady radiance. There was no tent. There was only a vast curtain of sparkling mist behind which shone the globe. He felt himself drawn through that mist, sucked through it as if by a mighty wind, straight for the globe. H.P. Lovecraft As the mist-blurred light of the sapphire suns grew more and more intense, the outlines of the globe ahead wavered and dissolved to a churning chaos, its pallor and its motion and its music all blended themselves with the engulfing mist, bleaching it to a pale steel colour and setting it undulantly in motion. And the sapphire suns too melted imperceptibly into the greying infinity of shapeless pulsation. Meanwhile, the sense of forward, outward motion grew intolerably, incredibly, cosmically swift, Every standard of speed known to Earth seemed dwarfed, and Campbell knew that any such flight in physical reality would mean instant death to a human being. Even as it was, in this strange, hellish hypnosis of nightmare, the quasi-visual impression of meteorite hurtling almost paralysed his mind. Though there were no real points of reference in the grey, pulsing void, he felt that he was approaching and passing the speed of flight itself. Finally, his consciousness did go under, and merciful blackness swallowed everything. It was very suddenly, and amidst the most impenetrable darkness, that thoughts and ideas again came to George Campbell, of how many moments, or years, or eternities, had elapsed since his flight through the grey void. He could form no estimate. He knew only that he seemed to be at rest and without pain. Indeed, the absence of all physical sensation was the only salient quality of his condition, it made even the blackness seem less solidly black, suggesting as it did that he was rather a disembodied intelligence in a state beyond physical senses, that a corporeal being with senses deprived of their accustomed objects of perception. He could think sharply and quickly, almost preternaturally so, yet could form no idea whatsoever of his situation. Half by instinct he realised that he was not in his own tent. True, he might have awaked there from a nightmare to a world equally black, yet he knew this was not so. There was no camp cot beneath him, 
He had no hands to feel the blankets and canvas surface and flashlight that ought to be around him. There was no sensation of cold in the air, no flap through which he could glimpse the pale night outside. Something was wrong, dreadfully wrong. He cast his mind backward and thought of the fluorescent cube which had hypnotized him, of that and all which had followed. He had known that his mind was going, yet had been unable to draw back. At the last moment there had been a shocking panic fear, a subconscious fear beyond even that caused by the sensation of demonic flight. It had come from some vague flash or remote recollection, just what he could not at once tell. Some cell group in the back of his head had seemed to find a cloudily familiar quality in the cube, and that familiarity was fraught with dim terror. Now he tried to remember what the familiarity and the terror were. Little by little it came to him, once Long ago, in connection with his geological life work, he read of something like that cube. It had to do with those debatable and disquieting clay fragments called the Outdown Shards, dug up from pre-carboniferous strata in southern England thirty years before. The shape and markings were so queer that a few scholars hinted at artificiality and made wild conjectures about them and their origin. They came, clearly from a time when no human beings could exist on the globe, but their contours and figurines were damnably puzzling. That was how they got their name. It was not, however, in the writings of any sober scientist that Campbell had seen that reference to a crystal disc-holding globe. The source was far less reputable and infinitely more vivid. About 1912, a deeply learned Sussex clergyman of occultist leanings, the Reverend Arthur Brook Winters Hall, had professed to identify the markings on the Eltdown shards with some of the so-called pre-human hieroglyphs, persistently cherished and esoterically handed down in certain mystical circles, and had published at his own expense what purported to be a translation of the primal and baffling inscriptions, a translation still quoted frequently and seriously by occult writers. In this translation, a surprisingly long brochure in view of the limited number of shards existing had occurred the narrative supposedly of pre-human authorship, containing the now frightening reference. As the story went, there dwelt on a world, and eventually on countless other worlds, of outer space a mighty order of worm-like beings who attainments and whose control of nature surpassed anything within the range of terrestrial imagination, they had mastered the art of interstellar travel early in their career and had peopled every habitable planet in their own galaxy, killing off the races that they found. Beyond the limits of their own galaxy, which was not ours, they could not navigate in person, but in their quest for knowledge of all space and time, they discovered a means of spanning certain transgalactic gulfs with their minds. They devised peculiar objects, strangely energised cubes of a curious crystal containing hypnotic talisman and enclosed in space-resisting spherical envelopes of an unknown substance, which could be forcibly expelled beyond the limits of their universe, and which would respond to the attraction of cool solid matter only. These, of which a few would necessarily land on various inhabited worlds in outside universes, formed the ether bridges needed for mental communication. Atmospheric friction burned away the protecting envelope, leaving the cube exposed and subject to discovery by the intelligent minds on the world where it fell. By its very nature, the cube would attract and rivet attention. This, when coupled with the action of light, was sufficient to set its special properties working. The mind that noticed the cube would be drawn into it by the power of the disc, and would be sent on a thread of obscure energy to the place whence the disc could come, the remote world of the worm-like space explorers across stupendous galactic abysses, received in one of the machines to which each cube was attuned, the captured mind would remain suspended without body or senses until examined by one of the dominant race. Then it would, by an obscure process of interchange, be pumped of all its contents. The investigator's mind would now occupy the strange machine, while the captive mind occupied the interrogator's worm-like body. Then, in another interchange, the interrogator's mind would leap across boundless space to the captive's vacant and unconscious body on the transgalactic world, animating the alien tenement as best it might, and exploring the alien world in the guise of one of its denizens. When done with exploration, the adventurer would use a cube and its disc in accomplishing its return. 
and sometimes the captured mind would be restored safely to its own remote world. Not always, however, was the dominant race so kind. Sometimes when a potentially important race capable of space travel was found, the worm-like folk would employ the cube to capture and annihilate minds by the thousands, and would extirpate the race for diplomatic reasons, using the exploring minds as agents of destruction. In other cases, sections of the worm folk would permanently occupy a transgalactic planet, destroying the captured minds and wiping out the remaining inhabitants preparatory to settling down in unfamiliar bodies. Never, however, could the parent civilization be quite duplicated in such a case, since the new planet would not contain all the materials necessary for the worm race's arts. The cubes, for example, could be made only on the home planet. Only a few of the numberless cubes sent forth ever found a landing and response on an inhabited world, since there was no such thing as aiming them at goals beyond sight or knowledge. Only three, ran the story, had ever landed on peopled worlds in our own particular universe. One of these had struck a planet near the galactic rim 2,000 billion years ago, while another had lodged 3 billion years ago on a world near the center of the galaxy. The third, and the only one ever known to have invaded the solar system, had reached our own Earth 150 million years ago. It was with this latter that Dr. Winter Hall's translation chiefly dealt. When the cube struck the Earth, he wrote, the ruling terrestrial species was a huge cone-shaped race surpassing all others before or since in mentality and achievements. This race was so advanced that it had actually sent minds abroad in both space and time to explore the cosmos, hence recognised something of what had happened when the cube fell from the sky and certain individuals had suffered mental change after gazing at it. Realising that the changed individuals represented invading minds, the race's leaders had them destroyed, even at the cost of leaving the displaced minds exiled in alien space. They had had experience with even stranger transitions when, through a mental exploration of space and time, they formed a rough idea of what the cube was. They carefully hid the thing from light and sight and gathered it as a menace. They did not wish to destroy a thing so rich in later experimental possibilities. Now and then some rash unscrupulous adventurer would furtively gain access to it and sample its perilous powers despite the consequences, but all such cases were discovered and safely and drastically dealt with. Of this evil meddling, the only bad result was that the worm-like outside race learned from the new exiles what had happened to their explorers on Earth, and conceived a violent hatred of the planet and all its life forms. They would have depopulated it if they could, and indeed sent additional cubes into space in the wild hope of striking it by accident in unguarded places, but that accident never came to pass. The cone-shaped terrestrial beings kept the one existing cube in a special shrine as a relique and basis for experiments, till after eons it was lost amidst the chaos of war and the destruction of the great polar city where it was guarded. When... Fifty million years ago, the beings sent their minds ahead into the infinite future to avoid a nameless peril of inner Earth. The whereabouts of the sinister cube from space were unknown. This much, according to the learned occultist, the Eltdown Shards had said, what now made the account so obscurely frightful to Campbell was the minute accuracy with which the alien cube had been described. Every detail tallied, dimensions, consistency, Hieroglyphed central disk, hypnotic effects. As he thought the matter over and over amidst the darkness of his strange situation, he began to wonder whether his whole experience with the crystal cube, indeed its very existence, were not a nightmare brought on by some freakish subconscious memory of this old bit of extravagant charlatanic reading. If so, though, the nightmare must still be in force, since his present apparently bodiless state had nothing of normality in it. Of the time consumed by this puzzled memory and reflection, Campbell could form no estimate. Everything about his state was so unreal that ordinary dimensions and measurements became meaningless. It seemed an eternity, but perhaps it was not really long before the sudden interruption came. What happened was as strange and inexplicable as the blackness it succeeded. There was a sensation of the mind rather than of the body, and all at once Campbell felt his thoughts swept or sucked beyond his control in tumultuous and chaotic fashion. 
Memories arose irresponsibly and irrelevantly. All that he knew, and his personal background, traditions, experiences, scholarship, dreams, ideas, and inspirations, whirled up abruptly and simultaneously, with a dizzying speed and abundance which soon made him unable to keep track of any separate concept. The parade of all his mental contents became an avalanche, a cascade of vortex. It was as horrible and vertiginous as his hypnotic flight through space when the crystal cube pulled him. Finally, it sapped his consciousness and brought on fresh oblivion. Another measureless blank, and then a slow trickle of sensation. This time it was physical, not mental. Sapphire light and a low rumble of distant sound. There were tactile impressions. He could realise that he was lying at full length on something. He could not reconcile the pressure of the supporting surface with his own outlines, or with the outlines of the human form at all. He tried to move his arms but found no definite response to the attempt. Instead, there were little, ineffectual, nervous twitches all over the area which seemed to mark his body. He tried to open his eyes more widely but found himself unable to control the mechanisms. The sapphire light came in a diffused, nebulous manner and could nowhere be voluntarily focused into definiteness. Gradually, though, visual images began to trickle in curiously and indecisively. The limits and qualities of vision were not those which he was used to, but he could roughly correlate the sensation with what he had known as sight. As this sensation gained some degree of stability, Campbell realised he must still be in the throes of nightmare. He seemed to be in a room of considerable extent, of medium height, but with a large proportionate area on every side, and he could apparently see all four sides at once, were high, narrowish slits which seemed to serve as combined doors and windows. There were singular low tables or pedestals, but no furniture of normal nature and proportions. Through the slits streamed floods of sapphire light and beyond them could be mistily seen the sides and roofs of fantastic buildings like clustered cubes. On the walls in the vertical panels between the slits were strange markings of an oddly disquieting character and it was some time before Campbell understood why they disturbed him so. Then he saw that they were in repeated instances, precisely like some of the hieroglyphs on the crystal cube's disc. The actual nightmare element, though, was something more than this. It began with a living thing which presently entered through one of the slits, advancing deliberately toward him, and bearing a metal box of bizarre proportions and glassy, mirror-like surfaces. For this thing was nothing human, nothing of earth, nothing even of man's myths and dreams. It was a gigantic, pale grey worm or centipede, as large around as a man and twice as long with a disc-like, apparently eyeless, cilia-fringed head bearing a purple central orifice. It glided on its rear pairs of legs, with its forepart raised vertically, the legs, or at least two pairs of them, serving as arms. Along its spinal ridge was a curious purple comb. A fan-shaped tail of some grey membrane ended its grotesque bulk. There was a ring of flexible red spikes around its neck, and from the twistings of these came clicking twanging sounds in measured, deliberate rhythms. Here indeed was Outre Nightmare at its height, capricious fantasy at its apex, but even this vision of delirium was not what caused George Campbell to lapse the third time into unconsciousness. It took one more thing, one final unbearable touch to do that. As the nameless worm advanced with its glistening box, the reclining man caught in the mirror-like surface glimpse of what should have been his own body, yet, horribly verifying his disordered and unfamiliar sensations, it was not his own body at all that he saw reflected in the burnished metal. It was, instead, the loathsome pale grey bulk of one of the great centipedes. Robert E. Howard From that final lap of senselessness, he emerged with a full understanding of his situation. His mind was imprisoned in the body of a frightful native of an alien planet, while somewhere on the other side of the universe, his own body was housing the monster's personality. He fought down an unreasoning horror. Judged from a cosmic standpoint, why should this metamorphosis horrify him? Life and consciousness were the only realities in the universe. Form 
was unimportant. His present body was hideous only according to terrestrial standards. Fear and revulsion were drowned by the excitement of titanic adventure. What was his former body but a cloak, eventually to be cast off at death anyway? He had no sentimental illusions about the life from which he had been exiled. What had it ever given him save toil, poverty, continual frustration, and repression? If this life before him offered no more, at least it offered no less. Intuition told him it offered more, much more. With the honesty possible only when life is stripped to its naked fundamentals, he realized that he remembered with pleasure only the physical delights of his former life. But he had long ago exhausted all the physical possibilities contained in that earthly body. Earth held no new thrills. But in the possession of this new, alien body, he felt promises of strange, exotic joys— a lawless exultation rose in him. He was a man without a world, free of all conventions or inhibitions of earth or of this strange planet, free of every artificial restraint in the universe. He was a god. With grim amusement, he thought of his body moving in Earth's business and society, all the while an alien monster staring out of the windows that were George Campbell's eyes on people who would flee if they knew. Let him walk the Earth, slaying and destroying as he would. Earth and its races no longer had any meaning to George Campbell. There he had been one of a billion non-entities, fixed in place by a mountainous accumulation of conventions, laws, and manners, doomed to live and die in his sordid niche. But in one blind bound he had soared above the commonplace. This was not death, but rebirth, the birth of a full-grown mentality and a newfound freedom that made little of physical captivity on Yekub. He started. Yekub. It was the name of this planet. But how had he known? Then he knew, as he knew the name of him whose body he occupied. Toth. Memory, deep-grooved in Toth's brain, was stirring in him. Shadows of the knowledge Toth had. Carved deep in the physical tissues of the brain, they spoke dimly as implanted instincts to George Campbell, and his human consciousness seized them and translated them to show him the way not only to safety and freedom, but to the power his soul, stripped of its primitive impulses, craved. Not as a slave would he dwell on Jacob, but as a king. Just as of old barbarians had sat on the throne of lordly empires. For the first time he turned his attention to his surroundings. He still lay on the couch-like thing in the midst of that fantastic room, and the centipede man stood before him holding the polished metal object and clashing its neck spikes. Thus it spoke to him, Campbell knew, and what it said he dimly understood— through the implanted thought processes of Toth, just as he knew the creature was Yokth, supreme lord of science. But Campbell gave no heed, for he had made his desperate plan, a plan so alien to the ways of Jacob that it was beyond Yokth's comprehension and caught him wholly unprepared. Yokth saw Campbell, saw the sharp-pointed metal shard on a nearby table, but to Yokth, it was only a scientific implement. He did not even know it could be used as a weapon. Campbell's earthly mind supplied the knowledge and the action that followed, driving Toth's body into movements no man of Jacob had ever made before. Campbell snatched the pointed shard and struck, ripping savagely upward. Yuckth reared and toppled, his entrails spilling on the floor. In an instant, Campbell was streaking for a door. His speed was amazing, exhilarating, first fulfillment of the promise of novel physical sensations. 
as he ran, guided wholly by the instinctive knowledge implanted in Toth's physical reflexes. It was as if he were born by a separate consciousness in his legs. Toth's body was bearing him along a route it had traversed ten thousand times when animated by Toth's mind. Down a winding corridor he raced, up a twisted stair, through a carved door, and the same instincts that had brought him there told him he had found what he sought. He was in a circular room, with a domed roof, from which shone a vivid blue light. A strange structure rose in the middle of the rainbow-hued floor, tier on tier, each of a separate vivid color. The ultimate tier was a purple cone, from the apex of which a blue smoky mist drifted upward to a sphere that poised in mid-air, a sphere that shone like translucent ivory. This, the deep-grooved memories of Toth told Campbell, was the god of Yekub. Though why the people of Yekub feared and worshipped it had been forgotten a million years. A worm priest stood between him and the altar, which no hand of flesh had ever touched. That it could be touched was a blasphemy that had never occurred to a man of Yekub. The worm priest stood in frozen horror until Campbell's shard ripped the life out of him. On his centipede legs, Campbell clambered the tiered altar, heedless of its sudden quiverings, heedless of the change that was taking place in the floating sphere, heedless of the smoke that now billowed out in blue clouds. He was drunk with the feel of power. He feared the superstitions of Yekub no more than he feared those of Earth. With that globe in his hands, he would be king of Yekub. The worm men would dare deny him nothing when he held their god as hostage. He reached a hand for the ball, no longer ivory-hued, but red as blood. Frank Belknap Long Out of the tent, into the pale August night, walked the body of George Campbell. It moved with a slow, wavering gait between the bodies of enormous trees, over a forest path strewed with sweet-scented pine needles. The air was crisp and cold. The sky was an inverted bowl of frosted silver flecked with stardust, and far to the north the aurora borealis splashed streamers of fire. The head of the walking man lolled hideously from side to side. From the corners of his lax mouth drooled thick threads of amber froth which fluttered in the night breeze. He walked upright at first, as a man would walk, but gradually as the tent receded, his posture altered. His torso began almost imperceptibly to slant and his limbs to shorten. In a far-off world of outer space, the centipede creature that was George Campbell clasped to its bosom a god whose lineaments were red as blood and ran with insect-like quiverings across a rainbow-hued hall and out through massive portals into the bright glow of alien suns. Weaving between the trees of Earth in an attitude that suggested the awkward loping of a werebeast, the body of George Campbell was fulfilling a mindless destiny. Long, claw-tipped fingers dragged leaves from a carpet of odorous pine needles as it moved toward a wide expanse of gleaming water. In the far-off, extragalactic world of the worm people, George Campbell moved between cyclopean blocks of black masonry down long, fern-planted avenues, holding aloft the red, round god. There was a harsh animal cry in the underbrush near the gleaming lake on Earth, where the mind of a worm creature dwelt in a body swayed by instinct. Human teeth sank into soft animal fur, tore at black animal flesh. A little silver fox sank its fangs in frantic retaliation into a furry human wrist and thrashed about in terror as its blood spurted. Slowly the body of George Campbell arose, its mouth splashed with fresh blood. With upper limbs swaying oddly, it moved toward the waters of the lake. As the variform creature that was George Campbell crawled between the black blocks of stone, thousands of worm shapes prostrated themselves in the scintillating dust before it. A godlike power seemed to emanate from its weaving body as it moved with a slow, undulant motion towards a throne of spiritual empire transcending all the sovereignties of Earth. 
A trapper, stumbling wearily through the dense woods of earth near the tent where the worm creature dwelt in the body of George Campbell, came to the gleaming waters of the lake and discerned something dark floating there. He had been lost in the woods all night, and weariness enveloped him like a leaden cloak in the pale morning light. But the shape was a challenge that he could not ignore. Moving to the edge of the water, he knelt in the soft mud and reached out toward the floating bulk. Slowly, he pulled it to the shore. Far off in outer space, the worm creature holding the glowing red god ascended a throne that gleamed like the constellation Cassiopeia under an alien vault of hyper suns. The great deity that he held aloft energized his worm tenement, burning away in the white fire of the supermundane spirituality all animal dross. On earth, the trapper gazed with unutterable horror into the blackened and hairy face of the drowned man. It was a bestial face, repulsively anthropoid in contour, and from its twisted, distorted mouth, black ichor poured. He who sought your body in the abysses of time will occupy an unresponsive tenement, said the red god. No spawn of Jacob can control the body of a human. On all earth, living creatures rend one another, and feast with unutterable cruelty on their kith and kin. No worm mind can control a bestial man-body when it yearns to raven. Only man-minds instinctively conditioned through the course of ten thousand generations can keep the human instincts in thrall. Your body will destroy itself on earth, seeking the blood of its animal kin, seeking the cool water where it can wallow at its ease, seeking eventually destruction, for the death instinct is more powerful in it than the instincts of life and it will destroy itself in seeking to return to the slime from which it sprang. Thus spoke the red round god of Jacob in a far-off segment of the space-time continuum to George Campbell, as the latter, with all human desire purged away, sat on a throne and ruled an empire of worms more wisely, kindly, and benevolently than any man of earth had ever ruled an empire of men. Isn't that weird and cool and kind of a mess? But it's a really interesting mess, both as a structural piece and as a story. The structure, the round robin approach, the other way that it is referred to as exquisite corpse or exquisite corpse is a similar system is actually something that's still in use. So much so, in fact, that Serial Box, who produce stuff like Bookburners and Tremontaine, are actually doing a free one for Halloween with some amazing authors, including Cassandra Kaur and Alyssa Wong. It promises to be just as much fun as this, although whether the spontaneous Worm King moment or an equivalent will happen remains to be seen. But like I say, it's free, and we'll put a link to sign up to it in the show notes. I suspect it will be an interesting companion piece. See, here's the thing. It would be really easy for me to kind of bust on this, to, to take the mickey a little bit. And I know at times it's very hard not to. There are a few phrases I've used more this year than we have to stop facing backwards on the rocket, and I firmly believe that to be true. If we want to steer genre fiction as a community and an industry towards the better place it deserves and needs to be, we need to see where we're going, not obsess about where we've been. Which is hard and difficult, and emotionally taxing, and takes years. Look at what happened when the World Fantasy Awards stopped being a bust of Lovecraft. Look how long it took for that vital change to be made, despite how justified the change was. Look at John W. Campbell's history, and then listen to Rebecca Rowanhorse's Campbell Award acceptance speech. We don't appreciate the future without the past. We don't avoid obstacles without knowing the obstacles we've run headlong into. We don't see how far we've come until every now and then we turn backwards on the rocket and see where we've been. But the thing is, this isn't even an obstacle. It's actually really good fun. I love how the stylistic gear shifts are papered over by the narrative ones. And there's a genuine sense of cooperation here that's honestly kind of inspiring. I'll go further. It's kind of sweet. Plus, it's nice to see Lovecraft and Howard just completely owning their favourite ticks. Lovecraft going all starry deep and Howard deciding that what we really need is a good bit of throne ascending. And again, I'm not busting on them. This is what these guys did. And they were some of the best in human history at what they did. Whether you liked them, whether you liked their beliefs, like I said, that World Fantasy Award, in my opinion, should have been changed decades ago. That's on you, but... 
here at least, you see these men's skills. Especially Belknap Long, which closes this story out. I think about that one the most. The desolate moment of realization that we are a cosmically awful species. By the way, that beat is still around too. The recent X Files episode, The Lost Art of Forehead Sweat, foregrounds it. The light implication of planetary apocalypse, balanced by the ever so slightly hopeful ending. All of it somehow delivered in maybe half a page. I don't know. Maybe Dr. Falcon from Wargames was almost right. Maybe it'll be the worm creatures, kindly ruled by the remains, or perhaps the memory of a man, lost and far from home, and no longer really able to care about those things, that will outlast us all. It's a haunting, powerful, even evocative image, and for it to come from a story that is so bolted together is... kind of inspiring. After all, even worms need kings, right? at least according to Belknap Long and Howard. We rely on you to pay our authors and cover our server costs and do a whole bunch of other stuff. There are three ways you can do that. The one which requires no financial outlay is signal boosting. Leave a review on iTunes or on Google. Request us on Spotify. Escape Pod's already there. The others are taking a little while longer. If you have a blog, invite us on. If you have a podcast, invite us on. We bloody love doing that. Strangely, even after all these years... Seriously, a rising tide lifts all boats, and you would be surprised how much the tide lifts when people stop talking about it. Of course, if you have money, that's great too. There are two ways that you can help there. The first is to donate through Patreon, where from a donation of five bucks a month gets you access to the premium content table, which is heaving under the weight of how much stuff is on there. Levels above that include at 10 bucks, you will be entered into a draw where once a month a winner will be picked and I will work with them to create a personalized reading recommendation list. We've done this twice. I've spent a good chunk of today drafting the third one. It's always tremendous fun and we've got really good feedback from folks for it. So if you fancy doing that and if you want to see what I will recommend based on the answers to the questions, then do, do please enter. Of course, if Patreon isn't your speed, there's always PayPal. You can subscribe for five bucks over there as well, or donate uh, as much or as little as you want. Regardless of which one of these you do, please understand, it's incredibly appreciated and needed, and we thank all of you from the bottom of our hearts, because without you, we simply wouldn't be here. We'll be back next week with Figure 8 by E. Catherine Tobler and read by Jen Zink. Then, as now, we will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. And we leave you with this quote from The Hills of the Dead by Robert E. Howard. By the way, I had another quote which involves some dialogue. And I was really tempted to do Kane's accent as James Purefoy does in the movie, but I like you people, so you're welcome. Cain gazed, awed. This was truly hell on earth. As in a nightmare, he looked into the roaring red cauldron where black insects fought against their doom and perished. The flames leapt a hundred feet in the air, and suddenly above their roar sounded one bestial inhuman scream, like a shriek from across nameless gulfs of cosmic space, as one vampire, dying, broke the chains of silence which had held him for untold centuries. High and haunting it rose, the death cry of a vanishing race. We'll see you next week, folks. Have fun. It's a pseudopod. It's a big foot. It's all about podcasts these days.